After seeing their effectiveness at the Battle of Hoth, you could hardly blame someone for wondering why ion cannons, like the one employed by the Rebel Alliance, aren't more common in the Star Wars universe. In today's video, we'll be breaking down ground-based weaponry and highlighting some of their major deficiencies. That and more after the intro. Today's video is brought to you by Audible. As you guys know, this is one of my favorite services. I've got months of Audible time because I love audiobooks and in my opinion, Audible is the best audiobook service. Audible has always offered an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre, but now you'll also, with your membership, discover exclusive Audible originals from a ton of different names that you probably know. As an Audible member, you get one title a month to keep from their entire catalog, including new bestsellers. Alongside an unlimited amount of audiobooks, Audible originals, and podcasts, with more being added each month. On the Audible app, you can listen everywhere. As I said, my favorite place is in the car. Looking for a recommendation? My go-to when people ask is always the original Thrawn trilogy. Make sure you get the unabridged version. But a little birdie has also told me that new Star Wars Legends audiobooks, including another entry in the Rogue Squadron series, are being added very soon. New members can try Audible free for 30 days at audible.com slash Eckhart's Ladder or by texting Eckhart's Ladder to 500-500. Links to that down in the description. Thanks again to Audible for sponsoring today's video. One of the most interesting aspects of Star Wars Warfare, in my opinion, is how planned Planets are actually taken. Once you win the space battle, how do you take the planet below? This difficulty is addressed in The Last Command, where Thrawn and Pelion reflect on the fact that it's almost impossible to take a really well-defended planet without suffering serious losses. The same discussion is also had in Wedge's Gamble as the New Republic tries to devise a plan on how to capture Coruscant. The difficulty with invasions comes from the array of impressive defensive technologies often employed by powerful planets. The most useful piece of technology, and one of the most expensive in my opinion, is the planetary shield. Planetary shields not only prevent bombardment, but if activated across the entire planet, also prevent things like troop landings. Additionally, we have ground-based weaponry, and that'll be the topic of today's video. The most prominent types of ground-based weapons were ion cannons and turbo lasers, but other weaponry was used, including the hypervelocity cannon, which was essentially a large and powerful mass driver. Ideally, your shield and the ground weapon work in concert and together can provide a planetary defense which can withstand pretty much anything. Going back to the invasion of Coruscant, for example, the New Republic realized that if Coruscant successfully got its shield up, that their only real option would be to starve the planet out, basically hold in orbit and wait for the citizens to start revolting. But let's talk primarily about ground-based turbo lasers and ion cannons. These really have several common features. First of all, these weaponry and placements were quite large, they were exceptionally expensive, and they were essentially scaled up versions of the same weapons you see on capital ships. According to the Essential Guide to Warfare, planetary turbo lasers were first commonly deployed 9,200 years before the Battle of Yavin and fire immense bursts of energy through a planetary atmosphere into space, getting targeting information from orbiting satellites or warships. The ion cannon, on the other hand, can disable the electrical systems of a warship in orbit, like we see at the Battle of Hoth. The benefit of these weapons are obvious. A ground-based turbo laser can even destroy a ship as large as a Star Destroyer. Multiple ion cannons and turbo lasers together in the right position could essentially take down a fleet. However, those advantages come with some serious disadvantages, some of which I alluded to earlier. The weapons, as mentioned, were almost prohibitively expensive. They could only operate on the richest worlds. Hoth was obviously an exception. The Alliance most likely scrounged the turbo laser itself, and some sources indicate that it was using a generator from an old dreadnought. Hoth was also one of their primary bases at the point, so it makes sense why they would dedicate time to protecting it. The weapons aren't something you can set up quickly. It's more than just the gun itself. There's an entire complex built into the weapon, including a power generator 40 meters under the surface. The other problem is one ion cannon on a fully inhabited world isn't going to do very much. And for a fully effective defense network, a planet would actually need hundreds of ground-based turbo lasers or ion cannons. These things would have given off a crazy power signature. Any fleet in orbit would be able to attack them. And if there's only one, just go somewhere else on the 
the planet. The guns also required an extensive support system. The new essential guide to weapons and technology says that the weapons are typically guided by sensor arrays, located not only on the weapons platform itself, but also at sensor stations or orbiting satellites, which feed data then to the targeting computer. Once that data comes in, the massive platforms are not essentially quick to react. Most modern turbo lasers and ion cannons still relied on simple gears to move positions. So, especially when you need pinpoint accuracy to hit a thing many kilometers away, it's not a quick process to set up and fire one of these weapons. They were also extremely complex and vulnerable, turning again to the essential guide to weapons. That source really highlights the energy requirements and the amount of technology required for one of these defenses, stating that a single turbo laser blast represented the power consumption of a large city for an entire day. While some guns did have defenses built in, ultimately they're big, highly valuable targets, and if the enemy can get under the planetary shield, they're going to be something that are hit almost instantly. That actually brings me to, I think, the biggest flaw when it comes to these ground-based weapons, and that's how they work with planetary shields. The whole thing about a planetary shield, especially when you're seeking to hold out against a sustained invasion, is that you don't want to let anything in or anything out. That means the shield has to stay up at all times, which means that the weapons won't be firing on anything in orbit. Some planetary shields have the capability to take down small sections, and that's where some advanced defensive techniques come in. You prep the gun to fire, briefly lower the shield, shoot the shot, and then put the shield back up. The problem is, this opens your defenses up to vulnerabilities, starfire, Fighters, transports, whatever can fly into this opening, and any sophisticated enough commander is going to start saturating that part of the shield with fire, so the second the shield goes down, the planetary guns are gone. Because while they can strike out at a ship in orbit, ships in orbit can also hit back. One good use case that the new essential guide to weapons and technology points out is early prevention of attacks and also the psychological effects of having the massive weapons. On the latter point, having the guns is reassuring to local populations and is probably enough to ward off pirates or scoundrels who are looking for an easy target to prey on. On the first point, although the power consumption of an ion cannon or ground-based turbo laser is massive, it's not as massive as a planetary shield, which also takes a while to activate and raise. So when an enemy fleet shows up at your doorstep and the shield's not quite ready, it's good to have those guns to at least make them think twice before launching an all-out assault. There's also the Hoth situation, and there, the ion cannon is effective to cover transports as they're making an escape. That was not a technique that could have been used over a long period of time. For one, once the Imperials reached the ground, they quickly disabled the cannon, but the fleet in orbit could have also struck it because the Hoth planetary shield was being continuously dropped. One sort of weird nuance about Hoth's shield is that it didn't actually cover the entire planet. The rebels probably didn't have the resources for it. Rather, it was sort of an umbrella. So the Empire essentially just went around, landed troops on the surface, then walked their way to Echo Base. Had Hoth had a full planetary shield, rebel strategy may have been slightly different, though most likely I still think they would have wanted to flee as having a serious portion of your leadership trapped with a fleet surrounding you is not great for the survival of your faction. But guys, those are the issue with planetary defensive weapons. Did you enjoy this video? Is there something I missed? Let me know that and more in the comments. Thanks so much again to the sponsor of today's video. You can check the link in the description for everything you need. Until next time, be safe, have a good one, and may the force be with you.